Lessons from the cross. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. Exodus chapter 12, 1 through 13. On this communion Sunday, we're going to go back into the Old Testament to get to our foundational place of to find out what is communion in the Christian church all about. We know kind of why we do it, but we need to take a little deeper dive to really understand what's going on. So we're going to read uh, Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Aaron was Moses' brother, for those of you who don't know, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor. T having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be, uh, must be year old males without defect, without defect. And you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the house where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over, fire, over the fire along with the bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with the head, the legs, and the internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. And I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive, no destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Notice he says, tuck your cloak in your belt. Don't let it hang down. Put your sandals on, get your staff in hand. You know why? Because you're out of here before you know it. You need to be ready to leave. Yeah, but Pharaoh has a mean, mean, heavy hand on us, not for long. Hundreds of years, for hundreds of years, the descendants of Abraham, who God made a covenant with to make a great nation from his loins when he was old and didn't even have any children. He said, you watch what I do. After a while, they became enslaved as they grew in number under Pharaoh in Egypt. Many of you know this story, and many of you don't but I'm gonna tell it in a way where we can all kind of understand it. Their lives were hard, laboring week after week as slaves, month after month, year after year, without any hope for themselves or their future generations to be set free from a life of slavery under a brutal hand of a king who absolutely hated them and absolutely loved the free labor that they provided for him to build his mighty nation, the nation of Egypt. And when God called Moses in the early part of Exodus chapter three to be his instrument to deal with Pharaoh about the brutal treatment of his special people that were in covenant through him, through Abraham. 
He sent 10 plagues into Egypt to judge Pharaoh and judge the nation. And all these plagues, plagues of blood, plagues of flies, plagues of frogs, these were all gods. These were all small g gods in Egypt that they worshiped and they had faith in. And God was showing them that their gods were nothing compared to the one true God of Abraham, his son Isaac, his son Jacob, and their descendants. So as we understand that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed, God is showcasing in this story what the Messiah of Israel will look like and what his ministry will actually look like 1400 years in the future with Jesus coming on the earth. And with the 10th plague that God sent, he sent a death angel through the nation of Egypt and which would kill every firstborn child in every household and every firstborn uh, male animal as well. It was gonna be judgment on the nation of Egypt and it was going to be hard it was going to be fierce and what happened was is I personally believe through my studies I personally believe that this was payback those of you know the story this was payback for all the Hebrew babies that Pharaoh ordered to be killed in the early part of the book of Exodus throw every I quote throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River but you may let the girls live. This is exactly what communist China did for years to, be, to keep population control down. And to, because Pharaoh was concerned that each, uh, Israel was gonna get so numerous that they would actually side and make alliances with their enemies and turn against them militarily and take them over. So to stunt the growth of the, of the Israelites they enslaved them and also said, we're gonna control their population by killing all the Hebrew boys. But praise God, many times the midwives who helped deliver these babies were convicted with the fear of God. And they made up stories to say, to try to save these children. That's how Moses was saved. Moses was put in this little basket and put into the Nile River by his mother and his sister, who said, we don't know what we're gonna do with him. I know he has a death sentence. But somehow, as we know, Pharaoh's daughter came when she bathed in the Nile and she saw Moses, the baby, in the little basket. And she took compassion on him and took Moses into her house and raised him in the palace. That's a good story because Moses should have died, but he was miraculously saved. But Moses was saved like all of you and all of me. He was saved for a purpose. He was saved for a purpose. His mother didn't know the purpose. His sister didn't know the purpose. He didn't know the purpose. But he was saved for a purpose. And that purpose was to be the instrument of God to deliver his people out of Egyptian slavery. Everyone is saved for a purpose. When Jesus has mercy and compassion on a person and pulls them out of the world, out of the devil's camp, out of a hellish situation beyond this life in eternity, we're not just saved to sit around and do nothing. We are all saved for a purpose. When I was saved 40 years ago, I had no idea I'd be standing in front of this pulpit. That was far from my understanding. First of all, I wasn't ready anyways. I, you didn't want me to preach to you 40 years ago. Okay? I was a different person. But anyways, God had to do a work in me to put me behind the pulpit. But I was saved for a purpose long before I knew what that purpose was. The same holds true of all of you. But I also believe that when he started throwing all the Hebrew boys in the Nile, which was a bad thing. I also believe that when Pharaoh sent 600 chariots after the children of Israel, his best fighting men, to follow them into the parted Red Sea, to go after the children of Israel to bring them back to be slaves. What happened, as you know the story, or you saw the movie, The Ten Commandments, whatever, as soon as Israel got through that water, then Moses raised his staff again. And as Pharaoh's armies chased them into that departed sea, all the walls of water came down and crashed onto Pharaoh's armies, 
killing all of them. You can read about that in Exodus 14. Destroying his army and his military might right in front of Pharaoh's eyes, thus ending Egypt's quest for world power and world domination in one fell swoop. And when I read that story, I believe that God judged Pharaoh and Egypt with water. Why? Because Pharaoh ordered the death of his people by water, by throwing Hebrew babies into the water in the Nile River to drown, be eaten by crocodiles and whatever else. God says, you wait, your time's coming. Now, God is patient with his justice, but I believe he judged Pharaoh and Egypt with water as he tried to destroy his people with water. Now, those are my personal beliefs. You're not gonna find that detail in the Bible. But, you know, I believe people reap what they, they, they will reap what, what they sow. And God will curse anyone who touches Israel. Why do I know that? Is Israel perfect? Far from it. But God made a promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. He said, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. Anyone who comes against you is dealing with me. He made that promise to Abraham when he made a covenant. And you can see this little Jewish nation and all the Jewish people time and time and time again, people have tried to destroy them and wipe them out the face of the earth, yet they still live and still stand. That is amazing, that is a miracle. Even though they suffer greatly because they rejected their Messiah, and they suffer greatly because Satan hates God's people. We, the church of God is God's people. The Christians are God's people. But God still has a plan for Israel in the end times. And he wants many of them to come to know Joshua, their savior, Jesus Christ. But they've suffered greatly. But know this, he made that promise to Abraham and Pharaoh and Adolf Hitler and many others found out the hard way that you do not touch Israel. So anyways, I want to focus this morning, before our family lunch was our communion lunch really, is how they observed in Israel and the early church the gathering together to have communion. How they did this and why they did this. I want to expound where communion or the Lord's table in the Christian church actually came from and why it's important to observe on a regular basis. You and I can always learn from the Passover meal many things for ourselves, but also about the Israelites, about Jesus, the blood itself and the blood of the cross to break the stronghold of sin over people's lives, to break satanic power over people's lives, to break legal satanic authority over people's lives, to break bigotry in our own hearts, oppression, and really create freedom in our lives. That's what Passover teaches us, and that's what communion teaches us of who we are in Christ and who we are as a family together with one another. So the Israelites were sinful people like any other human beings, and they were not worthy of the deliverance they received from the hand of God. However, what set them apart from the Egyptians, they were under covenant, divine covenant with God. And they didn't even really understand it. They didn't realize it, but because of their forefather, where they came from, they were under covenant, which we know now is the old covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. But they were under covenant of God's chosen people that began with the covenant he made to Abraham or Abram. And what happened was he said, I'm going to multiply your generations and you don't have any children and you're old. You're in your late 80s and your 90s and I'm going to bear children through you. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe you, God. I can't see it, but I'm going to believe you. His wife didn't believe him. But we know the story. It did happen. And what happened is what makes Israel a special people is because of God's covenant he made with them to be the womb, the mother, the one nation on the earth created to worship the living God. Because all the other nations of the earth did not worship the living God. They were all paganistic. They were all wicked. They were all idealistic. They were demonic. And what happened was, is I needed a nation to rise up and worship me so that I could bring my Messiah and the Savior of the world through that nation, because I can't do it with the other nations. Just as a side note, as America, you see we live in America, in our moralistic Christian underpinnings, 
which helped us to become a, it wasn't perfect the way it, it was lived out, but we had a system on paper that basically helps us to live by a set of values, a set of rules to live by in our nation. And it was all the Judeo-Christian ethic. It wasn't perfect the way it was lived out. No nation's perfect. But what we see happening in our nation now, people, is a paganistic philosophy and a paganistic culture that's raising up in America. That's what we're seeing. And when a, when a nation becomes more paganistic in their philosophies, you begin to worship other things. You begin to worship self. You begin to worship your feelings. You begin to worship what you want. You begin to worship all types of things. And in those cultures, women and children are less safe. Women and children are less safe in pagan cultures. We see that now. Women right now can't even go into a locker room in a gym and shower and change without a man having the right to walk in there because he feels like a woman that day. I don't care if your daughter's 12 years old. She has to deal with that. We see that in universities and colleges. This is paganistic philosophies, and it makes women less safe. We see children, what's happening with children with gender-altering surgeries and all these things going on right now, and it's predicted right now that suicides from transgender children, when they become adults, when they can't reverse what they did, 200% raise uh, rates in suicides. I just did a funeral. I did two funerals this week. I did one yesterday and I did one Friday. The one I did Friday, the guy, the guy who works in the funeral home told me, he says, we have a lot of suicides lately. He told me that, see? I never know the, the backstory unless I talk to the family because the funeral home was not legally bound to tell me what happened. That's confidential between them and the family. But sometimes the family will tell me what happened. But he told me Friday, he says, we've had a lot of suicides lately. I said, unfortunately, it's probably going to increase. Because since COVID, since COVID-19, 2020, suicides are through the roof. Because people look at the world as hopeless right now. Younger people look at the world as saying, what have I got to look forward to? Because there's no moral underpinnings in our culture. And they look at this and say, what hope do I have? We know what the hope is. We need a revival in this world. We need the Lord Jesus Christ to break through and we need a strong revival. The very thing they don't want, the very thing the government and the colleges and the universities and the media and everything else, they don't want. They don't want God in their face. But that's exactly what they need. And that's what our culture needs. That's why you and I do not back down right now. We stand strong for our Lord. We don't back down. We're not arrogant. We're not looking for a fight. But if a fight comes to us, okay, I will stand for the Lord. And I'm sorry if you don't like that, because I have to answer to him one day, and I know the truth. And so do you. I'm okay now. Fine. Got a little passionate there. But that's what's needed. That's what's needed. Christianity, or the Holy Spirit through Jesus, pushes out the pagan gods and brings in the Holy Spirit. Women, children, families are more safe in those environments. But when that gets pushed out in view of a pagan culture and pagan deities, it doesn't mean that we're, we're erecting all kinds of idols and stuff. We have other idols that we begin to worship, and they're all demonic, and we see that unfolding before our eyes. This was ancient Egypt that they lived under. But what happened was, is we see that human beings, like the Israelites, they didn't always get along. They didn't always get along. They were all slaves in Egypt, but they didn't get along. They had issues with each other. They had things that separated us as well because everything will find a separation point with human beings. And it caused disunity among the Israelites. But because of their hardships, because of their fighting, because of their skirmishes with one another, they failed to see what they had in common. And what did the Israelites and the Pharaoh's heavy hand have in common? First of all, they had a common enemy. Pharaoh was their enemy. Pharaoh hated them, and Pharaoh was in business to oppress them, to exploit them, and to destroy them, and to take every freedom and every 
hope of their future away. Doesn't the devil do the same thing? What else do they have in common? They had another common thing in common. They were all slaves. They were all slaves. They had no freedom. They had no future. They had nothing. They were all slaves. Along with their children and along with their grandchildren, they were slaves. They had no future hope of any freedom. They all had that in common. The other truth is they were all poor. They all had nothing except for a few personal items perhaps they might have had. They were all poor. They were all powerless. That's the other thing. They had that in common. They were all powerless to do anything about their situation. And another thing they had in common, they were worked half to death and they were all weary. They were tired. They were oppressed. They had all these things in common. Yet their divisions, their strife, their skirmishes got them away from those common things that they had. And even when they were set free by the mighty power of God's hand through Moses, they were aimless. They didn't even know how to live their lives anymore as they walked into the desert. But God began to speak to their leader, Moses, to set up a certain guidelines for them. It was 613 laws, including the Ten Commandments. You're free now, but you're not free to live any way you want. I'm the one who set you free. You're the one, you are responsible to me. I, you belong to me, I am now your father. But they were a family of oppressed people with many things in common, but their differences and their hardships kept them from the reality that they had a common plight. They had to focus on the one thing they had in common, but their skirmishes and their divisions kept them divided until Exodus chapter 12 came around, which we read this morning. The word of the Lord through Moses, he said, have them kill a lamb or a goat and put the blood on the top of the doorpost and on the sides. And when the death angel comes through Egypt, which is my final judgment, which will make Pharaoh release you, when I take his very own son from him and show him that his gods are no match for me, it's a slow process. I'm going to do 10 plagues to judge him, to judge his gods, because I want him to be painful, and I'm going to harden his heart so he can't repent, so I can keep judging him for what he's doing to my people. But this 10th plague was the last one. The death angel came through Egypt. However, when this death angel saw the blood, it passed over that house. Now, get this. The angel didn't recognize the Israelites and the Egyptians. The death angel recognized the blood. It didn't care about Israelites. It didn't care about Egyptians. When it saw the blood, it passed by it. The blood was God's protection over that house. The blood is what separated the Israelites from the Egyptians. The Israelites were just as sinful as the Egyptians. It's just the Egyptians had the other ha upper hand. But God said, when I see the blood, the death angel will pass over and you will be spared. It was all about the blood. This blood applied, the 10th plague, is the blood, the, the death broke. It broke the will and the power of Pharaoh. And he yielded to a greater power and freed the people from their slavery and bondage. Are you beginning to see the people? Are you beginning to see the picture here, Christians? Are you beginning to see the correlation? God always foreshadows what he's going to do in the future. He gives us signs. He gave us many signs in the Old Testament foreshadowing Jesus Christ. I could go into so many of them. But what happened was... The lambs and goats that were slaughtered and the blood applied on that inaugural Passover, 1,400 years before Jesus was on the scene. And they celebrated that every year of what God did to deliver his people out of an impossible situation that enslaved them to more powerful overlord. And the night Jesus had his last supper with his disciples, 
They were having the Passover celebration 1,400 years later, and Jesus was teaching them that this whole story that you grew up with, that your fathers grew up with, your grandfathers grew up with, even I grew up with, this whole story that we are celebrating tonight all pointed to me. It all pointed to me. As the lamb led to the slaughter for the sins of the world, that's why I must be given. Everyone from Israel and the whole world is under a mightier Pharaoh called Satan or the devil in the powers of darkness. He is the God of this world that enslaves and oppresses the people of this world. He is the God of this world that uses corrupt politicians and world leaders and kings and all types of people for his dirty work to oppress the people of the world. He promises them the elitist of this world. You'll live the high life as long as you let me continue to use you to oppress the world. And also, what happens is, when we submit to God in Jesus' name, after coming to him initially and becoming his child, what makes you and me any different in the sinful world? We struggle with sin. We struggle with all types of things. We're still in this human body. But when God the Father created the world who has been offended beyond belief, starting in the Garden of Eden all the way down, when he looks at you, when he looks at me, when he looks at anybody who has humbled themselves to say yes to Jesus and repent and receive forgiveness and grace, what does God see? He sees the blood. He sees the blood when he looks at you and me before he sees our sin. And he continues, even if you're in this right now, you are struggling with some sin that you are having a hard time overcoming. If you're in Christ, he looks at the blood before he looks at your sin. Now, if you're a religious person, that'll drive you batty. I'm not a religious person. I'm a godly person. It's different. I know my position in Christ. I am forgiven. I am in Christ. And I am blameless, holy, pure, and righteous in his sight. So are you. Why? Because of the blood because of the blood. And if you are caught up in some sin and you hate that and you hate the way you sin, you're in the right place. It says there's something right about you. It says there's something that you don't like about your behavior. That means the Holy Spirit is in you, convicting you, and you don't like it, and you're in a battle. And you're working your way through the struggle it and overcome it. But in that process, you are still His because the blood is on your life. It's the new covenant. We were all slaves. We were all in bondage. We were all struggle. We were all on the same point. I don't care if you make a million dollars a year or you make ten dollars a year. It doesn't matter who you are. We're all in the same boat. We are all slaves to demonic power. We are all slaves to our sin. We are all slaves until Jesus comes in and breaks the power of Satan over your life. And now you are set free and you are a new creation. And now you are a citizen of heaven. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can't do that for ourselves. He did it for us. We just responded, said, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord. You get saved, you come across the aisle of faith, and you don't know a thing about the Bible. But then you start reading it. Then you start understanding. Then you start hearing things. I am a new creation. Yes, I'm in a spiritual battle against my own flesh. I'm in a spiritual battle against the demonic powers. I'm in a spiritual battle against the world who doesn't know me or my Lord. But that's okay. I'm covered in the blood. That's the gospel. Oh, you're giving people license to sin. No, I'm not. People sin every day without a license. That's not what I'm doing. I'm saying if we all struggle with sinful habits, but if you don't like it and you hate it and it, can, it just makes you feel, just, I, I hate myself, it says there's something right about you because the Holy Spirit's in you saying, submit to me, work with me, get in the word, have people pray with you, fast, do whatever you have to do to break that thing. Because legally, Jesus has broken bondage over our lives. He's broken the power of sin over our lives. He's broken the power of devil over our lives. He's legally done that. 
We just have to walk it out. We just have to walk it out. But as we're walking it out, you're still his. Why? Because of the blood. He sees the blood before he sees your sin. That is amazing when I think about that. that I can't describe the gospel any other way. So good. So good. Let me wrap this up. I got two scriptures on the back of your, back of your handout. Really want to drive this home. I want to look at Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29. Paul writing to the Galatian church. He says this, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. Some of your versions say Greek, Jew or Greek. Jew or Gentile, neither slave or free, neither male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. We came out of what God did with Abraham. It was a wider birth that happened to us. Let me explain this. What I just said to you, Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male, female. When this was written, you have no idea the walls that were between these people. Men didn't hang out with women in these cultures, unless you were related. Jews didn't hang out with Greeks or Gentiles. That's a fact, because they were better than Gentiles. We're holy, we're people of God. They're a bunch of swine and pig. That's the way they looked at people, without seeing their own sin. And women and men, as I said, did not hang out together. Yet, he said there was no difference Jesus brought the walls down and brought us in as a family. You need to understand something. This is what the church is. It's a group of forgiven people with the blood of Christ in their life that have a room set for them in heaven when they leave this world. And we are a family that would never hang out together if we weren't saved. Think about that. Many of us would not even hang out with each other. We wouldn't do life together. Why? Because I'm so different than you, and you're different than me. We don't like the same music. We don't like the same politics. We don't like this. We don't like this. But those walls come down when the blood of Christ is on your life because we recognize we were all slaves. We recognize we had a common enemy, which is the ultimate Pharaoh, Satan himself. We realize that we are all in bondage. We're all oppressed. We realize that we're all spiritually bankrupt. And we realize that we all need Jesus every single day. And the blood that makes me clean and holy before the Father makes you clean and holy before the Father. And no religious act can do that. It's supernatural. It's an act of grace and mercy. I love it. I love it, yes. And with the birth of the church, what happens is we always have to fight to maintain the unity, the attitude of equality with one another, because we are all equal in the Lord's sight. We all need him. Now, I'm equal with you. I need you, you need me. Even though I'm your pastor, I'm going to have a stricter and a higher judgment than you, so it puts me in a higher position in the kingdom of God, but I'm only higher as a pastor. I'm not higher as a human. You and I, we all need the blood of Christ. I need you, you need me, and we do life together. That's the church. The communion table that we usually observe is the new Passover, because Jesus instituted something brand new that night when he said, this is the blood of my new covenant. It's a brand new covenant I'm establishing. It's a covenant of love, of grace, of mercy, and relationship with the one true God. As the Holy Spirit invades your life, as you put your hands, you put your life in my hands and you become mine. And then you have brothers and sisters, people you would normally never hang out with. You now do life together. Lastly, 
when the church was born. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, when the church was brand new, it was in its purest state, like a brand new baby. Where's Josephine? Back there? Okay, everybody look at Josephine. That's our newest church member back there. Okay, Josephine, all right? Pure and holy and brand new like Josephine. This is where the church was. This was revolutionary work of the Holy Spirit. Nothing on earth could have touched it, and nothing on earth matches it today. I'll end with this. Acts 2, 42-47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Get this. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. I'd like to see that happen right now in America. They sold properties, houses, says, give, give it to the pastor, says, give this to anybody who has need. What? That's how revolutionary it was when this happened. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. Jew, Gentile, men, women, slave, free, all types of people, all types of ethnicities. Remember, this happened at the Passover in Jerusalem when people from all over the world came to Jerusalem once a year to observe the Passover, from all types of nations, all different skin colors, all different flavors and sizes, but they were all Jewish. And this is when this happened. And the church was born. We know earlier in Acts chapter 2, there were 3,000 people that came to, came to the Lord. And they were baptized. My goodness, that's how big this church was. And it blew up, and you know what? People were just filled with God's Holy Spirit. They were filled with a new, a new love, a new care for everybody of this new thing that was happening. The original communion was a meal celebrated in homes, which was surrounded by prayer, helping one another, joy that what Jesus had done for them, and basically their new forgiven lives in Christ and what they all had in common. They were all slaves, now they're free. That's us. The communion table, which we do, which most churches do, it's not wrong. It's not wrong. It's just a little incomplete. Because it does involve prayer, it does involve fellowship, encouraging people, even with people you don't agree with. We center on the bullseye, which is Jesus. And we remember what we have in common. That's what communion does, because we all needed the blood of Jesus, and we still need the blood of Jesus each and every day. And when Satan tries to attack you, and you stand and say, in the name of Jesus, I am a child of God. I have been set free by the power of Jesus Christ. I am now a citizen of heaven. I have the authority of God in my life, the authority Satan used to have in my life. Jesus took it away at the cross and resurrection and gave it to me. And in the name of Jesus, Satan, I stand against you right now, and I stand against you over my family, my wife, my children, and you get out of my house in the name of Jesus. This house is covered in the blood of Jesus. You will not destroy me, you will not attack me, and the weapons that are formed against me, they will, they will form, but they will not prosper in the name of Jesus. That's how you pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. You stand under the blood of Jesus and your authority as a Christian. You need to learn how to do that because we're under attack every single day. But you can stand in your freedom and victory if you learn how to fight, learn how to war. But know this, original communion was done in the temple courts, it was done in homes, and they did, there were the rich, there was the poor, and everything in between came together and they, they brought their, it was a potluck dinner. They brought their own food, but they shared it. They shared the filet mignon and the hot dogs. They all ate it together because, but the Corinthian church was not doing that and that's why the apostle Paul chastised them. But know this, we have to never lose the fact of who we are. We are forgiven, saved people children of God, new creations. But what makes us that is the faith we placed in the cross and the blood of Jesus Christ continues to keep us in that state. 
and we need one another. When we go in that room in there, you're sitting down eating with somebody, I'm going to challenge you. If you're talking with somebody and a need comes up, put your fork down and just pray. Pray for them. Let them pray for you. That's communion. So what I want us to do is to understand when we go in and have our communion meal, this is what it teaches us. We do life together. People who would normally never do life together because of their differences. We have one thing in common. We are a family under the blood of Christ. And we need to learn to treat one another well, love one another, pray for one another, encourage one another. And if you're hurting, I should be hurting. If I'm hurting, you should be hurting because we're a family. That is what communion is. Amen to that? Amen. All right. I'm going to pray over you right now. I want us to remember the Passover is what they all had in common. And when God said, bring them together, I need to teach them once again what they have in common before I take them out. We have to always remember, the Lord said, always remember, do this in remembrance of me so you never forget what I did for you and what you all have in common. So, Father, thank you so much for the communion table. Thank you for our communion meal. We pray a blessing over it right now that every bit of food would be healthy and nourishing to our bodies. We also pray right now, Lord, that we would understand that we were all slaves, but we all have been set free by the cross of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of his physical body. And we pray right now, Lord, that that blood would continue to help us to stand strong against the spiritual Pharaoh that chases after us every day into the Red Sea. But in Jesus' name, you allow those waves to crash down on him because no weapon formed against your people will prosper. So we stand in that belief, knowing that you are with us. Lord, help us to be representatives of your kingdom and your love to one another. Help us to forgive one another, to strive with one another, bear with one another, so many one another's. Thank you, Lord, for the church of Jesus Christ in this hour. Because we, as the world right now is almost like, it feels like a powder keg ready to pop. We know that you're getting ready to do something great. We want to be positioned to be a part of that when that happens. We love you, Lord. Thank you for setting us all free and looking at us through the blood of Jesus Christ first and not our sins. Our sins have been nailed to the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.